good evening everybody uh, it is my honor to introduce the speaker for today dr richard cash uh, dr richard cash is a senior lecturer on global health at harvard th chan school of public health dr richard and his colleagues conducted the first clinical trials of oral rehydration therapy ort in adult and pediatric cholera and diarrhea patients at the cholera research laboratory in bangladesh one of the major interest of dr richard cash is scaling up health programs and he is the senior editor of from one to many scaling up health programs in low income countries he has also documented the scaling up of the brac ort program a simple solution as a member of brac health group he and his colleagues have documented the brac tb dots program in making tuberculosis history community based solution for millions it is pertinent to mention at this juncture that one of every 100 children in india does not live to celebrate the fifth birthday because of diarrhea and india accounts for quarter of the world's tb burden and on average 1000 persons approximately die because of tb every day in india dr richard kash worked with brac uh, on their otep which taught over 13 million mothers and caregivers how to prepare and use ort in the home using the pinch and scoop method it is estimated by who researches that each year around 500 million packs of oral rehydration solution are used in more than 60 developing countries saving over 60 million lives around the world and in 2006 he was the recipient of the prince mahidol award and in 2011 he received the prize prize for improving health it is our pleasure to hear from you today sir we extend a warm welcome to you in the public policy talk series i would not take any more time in keeping everyone who are waiting to hear from you over to you sir thank you Thank you very much for those uh, kind uh, uh, introductory comments, and it's a pleasure to be back in Bangalore. Uh, however, uh, virtually it might be. I was uh, there in uh, early January to uh, 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 give some talks at a, a workshop at St. John's. So it's nice to be back, even though virtually. Uh, I thought what I would do is to look at scaling up of health programs, uh, and also uh, as embedded in this is uh, how incentives were appropriately used, uh, and what I've chosen to use this as a uh, to use the BRAC experience uh, as a model for what might uh, might be, what has done, what has occurred, and what might. Uh, Uh, B and I hope that this will generate a lot of interesting questions. Uh, so let me start uh, by. So who is BRAC and what is it? It it turns out it's BRAC is the world's largest uh, NGO uh, with over a hundred million with over a hundred thousand employees, and uh, both in its workforce and its outreach. Began in 1972 in post-war Bangladesh, uh, the mission has always been to work with poor people to bring about a positive changes in quality of life through a holistic approach, a very pro-poor and a very strong focus on empowering uh, people. Uh, Sir Fazli Abed, who uh, just passed away in in December at the age of 83, was very fond of saying, "A small is beautiful, but big is necessary." um they are in over uh, 70,000 bangladeshi villages with expenditures of over a billion dollars of which 80 to 85% is generated by brac itself uh they are also in 11 countries and have been rated uh, the number one uh in terms of quality and so on ngo in the world i as a disclaimer i should note that i am on the board of brac usa and have been associated with them uh in various uh, uh guises uh since its founding in 1972 now let me just uh, start out by uh, reviewing what the lessons for scaling up are um first of all it's multidimensional you need to commit to scaling up from the very beginning of a program so you have an ins and you have to have an institutional vision vision in this case it's to alleviate poverty and to create equity uh it's important that pilot programs with relevant research and evaluation be carried out and workers 
are trained prior to the scaling up, not uh, uh, as an afterthought. Management needs to be appropriate, very down to earth, and strongly supervised. Evaluate, adopt, and advocate, and consider a more realistic long-term frame. Oftentimes people think in terms of one, two, five years, uh, they think in terms of many years. So the first program I'm going to try to give some, uh, 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 some idea of how these come together is the Brax DOT program for TB treatment. Now DOTS is uh, short for directly observed therapy, short course for uh, TB treatment. It's the standard uh, used throughout the world, including India. Uh, when they began their program, they faced two problems. One, how do they identify cases early? Uh, because the longer someone is not identified, the more likely they are to spread the disease. And since this treatment of DOTS requires six months, there was a lot of people who would drop out uh, as soon as they started to feel a little better. And the concern here is that drug development, drug resistance would develop with people dropping out early. So the challenge was how to identify cases of tuberculosis in the community, in the community, not uh, a passive, that is where people would come to the clinic because they were feeling bad, but active going out into the community and actually identifying cases to ensure that treatment was uh, begun early and that treatment was completed. So it was begun, and both of these examples are historical, but are uh, ongoing, and so uh, I think it's, it's highly relevant. It was begun in 1984 and 85, which was their uh, trial programs in a sub-district with a population of 220,000, using what were called, and are still called, Shastik Shebekas, a village-based volunteer. Uh, clinical cases of uh, TB were identified using a, a very clear algorithm. That is, someone had a chronic cough, maybe a bloody cough, loss of weight, and so on. And this was done through active surveillance. So these Shastik Shebekas would uh, visit uh, uh, houses as part of their otherwise routine and identify cases, and then they would collect uh, sputum specimens. The uh, diagnosis at that time, and even now in most areas, is through uh, staining of the sputum and looking at the microscope. And then they provided a community-based treatment, directly observed treatment. So what was the program? Well, it was based on door-to-door -door service by the Shasta Shebeko. So she went to the house itself to uh, provide the drugs. Now, here is the, one of the innovations, uh, and uh, I hope we have some discussion on this. To participate in this program, the individual had to put up a financial bond uh, prior to treatment, or about 200 talk at the time, around three US dollars, which was returned on completion of treatment less a fee for the worker, but forfeited on non-compliance. And there were very clear guidelines as to what was non-compliance. If you stop taking the medicine and you didn't give a reason, uh, that would be considered non-compliance. Now, treatment was never denied because treatment was always available at a government facility, uh, which was within a certain distance from the village. The Shasta Shebeka uh, got a, a small incentive for finding cases and completing the treatment. Supervision and quality control was carried out by another group called the Shasta Kormi, who had 10 Shasta Shebekas under her control. And there was then a further layer of uh, evaluation and supervision by another level up. There was support both from government and from donors, and I will explain that. So the requirements of a bonding system, one, it has to be community-based. 
Treatment is generally delivered by non-professionals, since you don't, uh, although uh, uh, it could be ASHA workers, certainly. Uh, the community or program contributes the bond if the patient is too poor. So no one is denied treatment because of a lack of money. So the community, generally, RAC did not contribute to the bond. The community put up the bond if the patient was too poor uh, so that nobody was denied treatment. Treatment is clearly def uh, combined with education because the Shostashevika goes to the house and also inquires as a member of the community what is happening. There's a reliable backup healthcare system to handle any complications. So any complication would be referred and there's frequent supervision and excellent management. So who is the Shastashevika? She's a health volunteer, usually around 35, with children selected by the villagers. Uh, literacy is preferred, but not absolutely required. They're trained to recognize and treat common diseases, such as diarrhea, acute respiratory infection, including TB. And they also uh, uh, sell and distribute certain other products, such as uh, uh, material for uh, headaches and so on, uh, and, and things of that nature. They provide basic health care services to about 300 households or around 1,500 uh, uh, individuals. So here are some pictures, and I use a lot of pictures in this. Here is a Shasta Shebika in an urban slum area having collected uh, sputum and labeling it to be sent for uh, testing. Here is a, a, a worker uh, giving uh, drugs to somebody in the community. The worker is the one with the bag. And again, she's observing the individual taking the medicine. So for the first few months, it is directly observed therapy. After that, uh, then a week supply is given uh, and so on. Uh, after the person has been habituated into taking the drugs. Uh, they come together usually uh, uh, once a month for a few hours as a refresher course. And here's a group of Shastashevikas who have come into a BRAC center uh, for a, a continuing education. This is a, uh, a picture from Afghanistan, uh, BRAC, uh, one of their uh, countries that they also uh, uh, do work in is in Afghanistan, in addition to Sierra Leone, uh, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Kenya, uh, uh, and, uh, and so on. Here, the, uh, it is given through a pharmacy, uh, where again, an individual uh, is uh, treated right there. And, Later on, they set up TB dots corners in some of the hospitals and clinics, again, where this was distributed. What are the results of this program? Well, uh, and these are older data, but it, it's held true. 92% uh, cure rate, uh, about 3 tenths percent failure, 4% death. Now this is the next, is very, very important only 1.3% default. So over 98% are staying in the program. The cost is lower than the Ministry of Health. In 2006, the National TB Program and BRAC expanded DOTS to cover over 100 million people uh, with 78% case detection and treatment success up to 94%. Now, what factors then contributed to the success of this program? And this is true with many of their, uh, many of their uh, uh, scaled up programs, not only in health, but in agriculture, uh, education, uh, uh, their graduate program in uh, microfinance and so on. You learn from a pilot program with independent research and evaluation. BRAC has a whole department called Research and Evaluation Division, which is separated from the rest of the organization so they can act independently. 
In this case, the involvement of community health workers was very important with an incentive system for case finding and completed treatment. The patient provided a bond for reliable services because the drugs are free of charge. So nobody is paying for drugs. The only thing that uh, they're paying for is the services provided by the Shasta Shevika. The treatment is simple. It's right at the doorstep. There is strong management and the availability and use of external technical assistance. So if there are problems, that is bumped up the system and other uh, uh, advice is given. In fact, this program was uh, an outgrowth of a program that was advised by uh, a, a, a Japanese uh, uh, consultant uh, 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 and who helped Brack set this up uh, from the beginning. 